starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to have you join us today for our webinar in business improvement areas. My name is Susan Lowe. I'm with the Design, Coordination, and Outreach Branch of the Ministry of Jobs, Trade, and Technology. I'll be moderating and providing technical support for today's webinar and also making some of the presentation. I'm located in Victoria in the traditional territories of the Likwungan people, namely the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Before we get started, I'll just cover off some of our audio options on the GoToWebinar platform. If you have a headset or a microphone and speakers on your computer, you probably want to choose computer audio. But if you're concerned about your bandwidth or you don't have computer audio, you can select phone call instead and the dial-in information will be displayed. Uh, so make sure that you log into the phone system with the PIN number that's shown, and that's unique to you, and don't share it with anyone else. Uh, that unique PIN lets me mute or unmute your line if you are going to speak and ask a question during the presentation. The other parts of the control panel that we want to go over, the, uh, the orange arrow lets you hide or unhide the control panel at the side of your screen. It's going to hide itself automatically if you don't use it for a while. You can also go full screen with that blue button that has the white square. The raise hands button lets you show me that you have a question to ask uh, during the Q&A portions of the webinar. However, because there's many of you and one of me, uh, what I'd prefer for you to do is actually to ask your question by typing it into the enter a question for staff uh, space. And what I'll do is I will uh, look at those. If there's an immediate technical issue and I have a moment, I can help to troubleshoot for you, or I will save up your questions and ask them during breaks in the presentation. So another feature of the webinar platform is poll questions. In between each presentation, there will be, and sometimes during the presentations, there will actually be uh, quizzes. So pay attention, because we're going to do pop quizzes. The pop quizzes are going to come up as a poll on your screen, and I'm going to do uh, a test poll right now, just so you can see what it looks like. And this means you have to uh, put down your sandwich. Hope you're having lunch with us today. Put down your sandwich and come and vote. Uh, which kind of organization do you work in? So our invitations go out to local governments, economic development officers, community futures offices, chambers of commerce, uh, provincial government, some federal government, uh, a wide range of people. So it's good for us to find out who's on the call so we know what kind of audience we're speaking to. So I usually leave these polls open for um, yeah, 30 to 45 seconds. I watch the voter turnout. I can tell how many people have voted. So right now we're at 100% voter turnout, and that is fabulous civic engagement. So I will hide that, and I will share the results with you. So as you can hopefully see on your screen, just check that. Yes, there we go. We've got 50% of our uh, listeners, or 59% are from local governments. 18% uh, are from community economic development agencies. 18% from provincial or federal government. And 6% other. So if you're one of those wonderful other people, I'd love to know what kind of organization you work in. So you can just fire that into the questions box and I'll pick that up. Then one day you too can be included on that ballot. So I'll hide that and carry on with our presentation. So today's webinar is about business improvement areas. So the learning objectives for today is by the end you'll be able to describe what a business improvement area is and how it supports economic development and identify the stages and some of the wise practices in developing, supporting, and renewing a business improvement area in your community. So today's team for the presentation will have Gay Pooler, who was with the Downtown Kamloops BIA for 20 years. She's also on the board of directors of BIA BC. Uh, we've also had Terry James, executive director of Downtown Langley BIA, collaborating with us on putting the presentation together. However, she was unable to make it today, um, but we're very happy and glad that she was able to contribute to the session. I know we have a lot of other people on the webinar who have expertise in this area, so don't be afraid to uh, jot in some notes. We've got uh, about 20 people on the call right now. Uh, it's about half of the people who registered. Some people show up late, so we might get a really good discussion going on and some great information sharing. 
I also want to thank Lori Baxter from BIABC, uh, who helped provide some of the background details on BIAs uh, to inform this webinar. So um, now before we go even further, I'm going to run another poll because we want to know, does your community have an active BIA? I'm going to put it up there. I know some of you from, uh, from provincial government may not be sure how to vote. Well, just think about the location that you live in. Does your community have a business improvement association? We have fabulous. Uh, looks like we've got some really engaged viewers today. You guys are getting your, your voter, your votes in really quickly. And I hope that stays through to the end of the webinar because we do have some pop quizzes for you. So make sure you're paying attention when those come up. So I will close the poll and share the results. So 35% of our uh, viewers today have active BIAs in their community. 41% don't. 18% don't know and 6% we're working on forming one. So we'll carry on. So business improvement areas. I'm going to talk about some of the nuts and bolts, um, some of the enabling legislation, and then I'll turn it over to Gay for some of the, uh, the benefit of her wisdom in this field. Uh, one thing I forgot to mention at the beginning is that the webinar is being recorded and the presentation notes and the presentation itself will be shared on our economic development website. It takes us about a week to get the recording downloaded and converted and get all our materials together so we can put it there on our website. So uh, stay tuned, it will be there. Um, if you don't see it and you wanna reach us and ask for it, you can email economicdevelopment.gov.bc.ca. So business improvement areas. So there, the BIAs have been around as a concept for about 25 years, and there's nearly 75 across BC at present and growing all the time. This gives you a quick overview of where they're at regionally. And here are some of the, these are the locations. So these are the interior and the island. Don't worry, you don't have to write all these down. There will not be a pop quiz on this. This just gives you a visual look at where some of these BIAs are happening. You can see that in some cases, there's multiple BIAs within a, a, a particular town or name. You can see Campbell River has different improvement areas. Uh, and that's because it's geographically located and it doesn't usually cover the whole city or the, the whole town. We'll go into how that's formed in a moment. And here are the, uh, the Lower Mainland and the Vancouver area BIA locations. As you can see it's a pretty popular concept, but uh, there's lots of room for growth in the province, and that's why we're doing this webinar. So I'm just going to cover off some of the, uh, the governance frameworks. There's three levels of governance frameworks in a BIA. The community charter is the provincial legislation that defines what a business improvement area is and uh, sets up the enabling legislation for it. Municipal bylaws define how the BIA is set up in that specific jurisdiction. And then there's an organization that's formed to implement strategies and programs. And that organization will have its own board of directors and governance structure. The business improvement areas are formed through municipal bylaw under the guidance of the community charter, sections 210 to 219. BIAs are a specific and very particular type of local area service. So it's important to primarily look at sections 210 through um, 214 um, as the BIAs are established by a municipality using a local service area, as well as section 215, which pertains particularly and defines what a business improvement area is. As laid out under the community charter, section 25, a municipality may not provide a grant, benefit, advantage, or other form of assistance to a business, except as it relates to certain heritage objectives. So section 215 is the part that actually allows the creation of the business improvement area because it is an exception to that overall rule. So um, section 215 defines what a BIA is and says that a council may grant money that has to an organization that has, as one of its aims, functions, or purposes, the planning and implementation of a business promotion scheme. 
So it does so under the municipal bylaw. Um, section 216 covers the cost recovery method for the local service. So if the municipality is going to fund something, it has to get the money. In this case, um, so then sections 216, 17, 18, and 19 relate to borrowing for or enlargement or reduction of or merging of local service areas. So enlargement or reduction would require the area of a BIA to be redefined and then the petition to create the BIA would be undertaken again. So that typically is only done during renewal. So the business improvement scheme has to be operated by an organization, either a corporation or a society. Uh, there's information about the, uh, the startup of a BIA in the handout section of this uh, the webinar. So um, if you look in your control panel, on the left of your screen, there's a handouts tab. Um, if that is not showing up for any reason, uh, I'll take a look at it during Gay's presentation and see if I can get that for you. But the handout provides, okay, someone can see it, here we go. So that's a condensed handbook. Um, members of BIA BC can actually get access to uh, a very extensive handbook on how to get these going, as well as support to get one started. So, uh, Going on, so here's the, the five uses of a business promotion scheme. What, what does that actually entail? So you can carry out studies and reports on the area, uh, improving or beautifying streets or sidewalks, removing graffiti, conserving heritage property, or encouraging business, which is a lovely wide term, and Gay can talk more about some of the functions that BIAs have done to benefit economic development. So the community charter goes on to say that uh, the council can grant funds to an organization to run this business promotion scheme, but that all of the funds have to be recovered by means of a local service tax. Uh, and the council also has to define uh, what the business promotion scheme is, the maximum amount of money that's going to be granted, over what length of time, and any conditions and limitations on the receipt or the expenditure of the money. So how do you get one started? So the BIA can be created by a municipality either in response to a petition from the owners of the parcels that would be included in the geographic area, or the municipality can create uh, the bylaw and then use the reverse petition. So the two methods of creating a local area service are covered in section 212 or 213 of the community charter. So the petition has to define the service to be provided, the boundaries of the area, and that has to be shown on a map, and what the estimated costs of the service will be so that anyone signing the petition or anyone who has business uh, or commercial property in that area can be fully aware of the proposal and what it's going to mean for them. So both the cost uh, based on an average property and expectations of what they will receive in return for that cost. There's two thresholds that have to be met for this to succeed. So 50% of the owners of uh, affected parcels in the area uh, have to sign it. And the parcels that are represented by that petition have to represent at least 50% of the assessed value of the properties. Um, if you create it via a reverse petition, then the same threshold has to be met so if the municipality is creating a BIA and some of the uh, business owners, or commercial property owners don't want it, they have to pre present a reverse petition with at least 50% of the owners and 50% of the value saying, no, we don't want this to happen. And that is actually different than the alternative approval process that some local government people might be familiar with, where that under the alternative approval process, it has to be 10% of the lectures. So there's a different thing there. It's worth making sure you know what you're doing and checking that out before you go forward with it. Um, something else important is the BIA applies to properties within certain classes of properties, and it's usually class five, so light industry or class six business. And that is actually defined by the municipal bylaw when they're creating the BIA. Um, Gay will be going into more detail about the process of getting that going from the business community's perspective in a few minutes. <sighs> Carrying on, so the municipal bylaw. What does the municipal bylaw have to include under the community charter? So uh, 
it has to include a definition of what the business promotion scheme is to be. And the trick here is not to be overly prescriptive. The organization, the BIA organization, needs to develop the strategic plans and the implementation plans within those categories involved. So the organization also has to be an existing entity. Um, so it either needs to be a corporation or society before the bylaw is passed. Um, the bylaw has to cover how much money will the municipality grant to the organization. And that has usually been proposed and negotiated in advance based on what the promotion scheme is uh, supposed to be, and also what people in the area are willing to pay into the BIA. Uh, the bylaw can also contain other reporting requirements, although, as I said, being overly prescriptive adds a lot of overhead burden to what is typically a very small organization. So things I've seen in the bylaws that I've looked at include uh, requiring financial statements to be submitted, uh, wanting to see a budget, uh, some want to see insurance coverage, and this is something that is uh, agreed upon and set at the municipal level. Uh, there's usually an arrangement for when the money will be given to the BIA, so what time of year. And I've also seen some clauses that reiterate that the uh, BIA organization isn't allowed to commit the municipality to any expenses and that employees of the BIA will not be employees of the municipality. So uh, working with, if you're forming one, working with BIA BC and looking at examples of other municipalities, bylaws, gives you an idea of, of what you might want to put into yours. Um, okay, that's my bit. <laughs> Um, I'm just going to check to see if there's questions that have come up based on that, and there haven't been yet. <laughs> um, if you have questions about the legislation components of uh, BIAs or the Community Charter, Danny Carson is the Senior Program Analyst with the Ministry of Municipal Affairs and Housing in the Local Government Division. Um, there's his phone number and his email address, and I, I believe he is joined us uh, on the call as well to listen in, and uh, he helped me put together things. Oh, he hasn't joined us yet, but he may later. Uh, and if you have questions for him, by all means, reach out and he can clarify that. So quiz time. I hope you are uh, you're ready to apply your knowledge. I'm going to get things started. Which of the following is false? about BIA legislation. Let's see, who's been paying attention? One of these is false. This is where I would love to have the Jeopardy theme song to play for you on my computer. I'm not sure how that could, could work. Maybe I'll figure that out for the future. All right, we've got 70% of you have voted. Some people may have stopped to take a lunch break. That's all right. All right, I'm going to close things off. We're just under 70% voter turnout, and I will share the results. Here we go. So, which of the following is false about BIA legislation? The false answer is funding for a BIA, or sorry, funding for a BIA comes from residents of a community. That most of you got that right. Uh, the funding for the BIA comes from a local area service tax on the commercial property. So residents do not spend their money on this. It is a business community initiative. And I have one more quiz question for you here. And then we'll get on to uh, Gay's presentations. What is not one of the functions of a business improvement area? Hopefully this should be fresh in your memory. Do, do, do. Nope, can't sing, shouldn't sing. All right, we've got about the same voter turnout now. So I know, oh, just over 75%. Oh, 80% of you are, uh, are voting in this. That's great. Thank you very much. That's great civic engagement. Right on, guys. I'm going to close this off and share the results. So the wrong answer, is, or the, the right answer, what is not one of the functions of a BIA, it's providing a labor placement service. 
Uh, all of those other things are things that the community charter recognizes as part of a business promotion scheme. Now, the organization that runs a BIA may also have other aims and purposes, but you can't use the BIA funding for those things. So generally speaking, BIAs stick to the, the knitting of what's allowed, but Gay can talk about more of the things that she's seen BIAs do in her experience. So um, I will move on. As uh, we have Gay Pooler, who, as I mentioned, uh, was the executive director for the Kamloops Business Improvement Area for uh, 20 years. I had the joy of uh, going to Kamloops last week and actually going through downtown and enjoyed a lot of the extra perks and benefits that the BIA provided. Thanks, Gay. It was a lovely You're downtown. <laughs> All yeah, right. It is. Okay, I'm going to turn things over to Gay. She's got a presentation for you, and this is that moment in the in the webinar where we all wait to make sure that the technology works. Hope that technology works. Yeah. Yes, we have practiced this a few times. Here we go. Okay, I'm going to turn off my webcam so you can focus on Gay. Okay. So welcome everybody. Uh, today, the formation and function of a BIA will be covered in this portion of the presentation and why BIAs are positive and how they fit into municipal economic development and contribute to community development. Uh, BIAs range in size, budget, and focus, depending on the needs of the specific community. And BIAs are for every type of community, from downtowns to entire towns, to industrial parks, to neighborhood shopping districts. And municipalities, in my opinion, ideally should do three things. Um, encourage the formation of BIAs, uh, support the creation of the BIA organization, like the society, the board of directors, et cetera, and then partner with the business community and going forward, the BIA. So we will touch on each of these points in, in the presentation. But first, let's look at the why. So reasons why this is uh, beneficial for a municipality to do. Uh, they, BIAs can help you, from the municipality side of things, do your job of providing services and building a strong community. Uh, often the nonprofit sector, which BIAs are, can do things quicker, lighter, and cheaper than if a mun municipality undertook the same projects. No offense, but that's just a fact. Uh, and for example, one of the things that uh, BIAs do is they have the capacity and motivation to undertake public space management strategies, which this picture really shows uh, some good examples of things where we've got a, a bistro sets and games, the checkers, they're awesome, and you know, relaxation stations, that kind of thing. So really uh, working on enhancing the environment of your downtown or your uh, commercial district. And some of the more visible programs that BIAs finance uh, include festivals, um, ambassador programs, street clean teams, streetscape enhancement promotions, social programs, and increasingly the urban place management. Um, many BIAs stage or sponsor events or festivals in the downtown core that add to the 24 seven vitality of the area. So this, really helps to create those vibrant communities that we, we all want. Uh, this photo here is actually from a block party event in Kamloops. And it was, it, we closed down a block and it was an, a licensed event, and, but all ages were able to attend. So we had everything from street hockey to beer and wine sales. And it went really well. The, the new uh, provincial legislation for liquor licensing has really helped to enable this type of uh, family gatherings in the downtowns and it was very successful. So these are a few other photos of examples of, of things going on. Um, the upper right, you see uh, one of our ambassadors, the downtown ambassadors. They are a unique hybrid of hospitality greeters and security officers. They're friendly faces on the street to answer locals' questions and tourists about directions, safety, shopping, transportation, and destination recommendations. They also are trained so they can provide first aid and be the eyes and ears on the street for the BIA and be a liaison between the businesses and the, and the police. So there's a lot of BIAs that have created these uh, ambassador teams and some are different than others, but they're a really good uh, program. Um, they can also be utilized to gather statistical information, whether it's pedestrian counts, 
and that sort of thing for uh, that can be used for economic development and business attraction. And so now let's look at the three main points we started with, beginning with encouraging the formation of uh, BIAs. So, whoops, oh, go back. <laughs> Uh, starting a BIA requires a group of like-minded property owners. Oh, must have been some kind of, oh my goodness. What's going on here? Hang on, sorry. Something's going on with Is it, is it set to invent automatically? automatically? Well, it's not supposed to, no. <laughs> <laughs> not when I tested it. <laughs> so we'll see what happens here. Uh, They're beautiful pictures. Yeah. yeah, okay. So I don't know what's going on. But um, so, but starting a BI requires a group of like-minded property owners and businesses coming together with the common goal of improving a particular commercial area. It can be a lengthy process and requires significant outreach to the area businesses and property owners to garner their support and feedback. And so seeking out the champions within the business com community is important and start conversations with them about forming a BIA. Uh, you might already have a merchants association that is not a BIA with funding levy, and so reach out to them. And then help those champions to set up meetings. Um, communication with the merchants and property owners in the creation process is the biggest key, and also the most challenging. So to be able to get out there and really communicate with them and, and get them bought into the process is huge. And the creation process includes several steps. So establishing the need of a steering committee, identifying the initial BIA boundary, obtaining support from area businesses and owners, forming a nonprofit society, working with the municipality, you know, informing them of your intentions and enlisting assistance, canvass the area to gather input on priorities and adjust the BIA boundaries as needed, then develop a preliminary budget communicate the BIA proposal to business tenants and owners, and then submit the official BIA proposal to the municipality. And then the official municipal notification process begins. So how can you help in this process if you're from the municipal side? One way is to offer staff help to facilitate these meetings and meeting space, uh, and help to determine the best area to include in the BIA, because you, you want to be very careful about how you uh, determine that area and then help them to develop that budget for the first five years. They may need help working on a budget and help with strategic planning. We also would like you to invest in the process and uh, provide seed money for a BIA startup. It takes time and money and champions need someone to work with them to do all of the legwork. So they may have to hire somebody to help them get that going. And if the business people have not come to you, then go to them. They may not know about the potential for BIAs. So these pictures, uh, this little sh quick story, this is downtown Kamloops uh, some time ago. The, the bottom picture, I have not been around that long. The top picture I do remember, uh, it was in the 1980s when the uh, we lost Woodward's downtown and the, the downtown was going downhill fast and the, the businesses wanted to partner with the city. They realized we needed a major overhaul in the downtown and they were really long range thinking business people. So they went to the city and really pushed them to do some revitalization, but they pushed with money too. They were willing to pay. So they, it was a, a, a type of specified area tax, but it wasn't a BIA thing, but they did pay a levy over several years to help pay for these streetscape improvements. So it's a, a good example of uh, partnering. And then you want to support Number two point, support the organization uh, from creation through to implementation of strategic plan goals. And ideally make things easier, not more difficult. So you want to be able to remove barriers to change and improvement. You know, if you sometimes cities want to make a little bit too onerous bylaws for patios, for example, you want those patios out on the street. Look at the vibrancy that it adds to your street. So make it don't make it too difficult for the merchants to be able to do it. And, uh, you know, allowing business use of public space, even outside of patios, to be able to bring their products out onto the street. So allowing that is a, a really great uh, way. You want that connection of uh, between the pedestrians and the businesses. And if those businesses, you know, spill out onto the street out of their 
business is it really gives you that vibrant street feel that you see in this picture. And the other thing is to supply the property owner information and business license information that the BIA needs in order to be created and function going forward and when they're going through renewals. So they, they need that information and you don't want them to have to burn up a lot of resources to get that. And I know this is one of the uh, points right now that some cities are saying with worried about the freedom of information that they can't release that, but actually you can. So it's um, one of the things we we're trying to get uh, municipalities across the province to uh, come in line with as BIABC. Um, and don't, don't ask them to do things that are not required by the community charter, like, you know, financial audits and onerous reporting, asking for property owner support when it is supposed to be just a reverse vote. These are just examples of some of the things that have happened in municipalities and shouldn't, in my opinion. And um, then stand behind that organization as they're going forward and their initiatives. So if they want bylaws revised or created or they want to use public space, like this example shows here, uh, help them with that. So uh, like the revitalization tax exemption bylaw is a really good one that um, can be used in different cities. So help with that. And if there are any other incentives that can be created to uh, retain or attract businesses or developers, then work with the BIA to make those happen. Um, and realize that it does take a lot of time and dedication to see the results. You know, these things don't happen overnight. I was with the BIA downtown for 16 years and, you know, we made a lot of progress in that time, but some things were just like, oh my gosh, we're still talking about parking. But so, you know, really helped the BIA to get there and, and uh, realize that it, it doesn't happen overnight. Uh, and then help with the renewal of the BIA, which comes up every five or 10 years, depending on the, the span that they go for each time and help them through that process and the uh, potential expansions. And so some be, you can be a resource. And just some examples of how you can be a resource is to uh, supply staff time and advice and cooperation. Cities, many cities have great people working with them that have um, amazing t uh, knowledge and talent that can really help uh, the BIAs. You know, maybe help with annual general meeting assistance, special event planning, and giving grants for special projects, programs, or events things like a commercial uh, facade improvement grants. And then knowing your role in this whole process, which uh, Susan start, uh, explained part of, um, the community and charter enables the BIA bylaw. So the city is really an oversight group. So you wanna be that oversight, but not you know interfere too much, support them, but don't interfere too much. And uh, really understand the, the different scope of your, uh, you've got BIAs, the city, ECDEV, and you know, Chamber of Commerce, and they're all sort of working together. And, and some people say that, well, why do you need a, a BIA if you have a chamber? But they're quite different. Um, a chamber and the ECDEV, they look at the city as a whole and they promote the city as a whole. Whereas the BIA is very concerned about just their specific area. So that's the area that they wanna promote. And you know, the chamber is, does a lot of uh, advocacy for provincial and federal level. So, which is good, sometimes the BIA feeds things through them to get that advocacy done. So working together is really good, but really to understand the different mandates. Uh, and just going back to the financial reporting requirements a little bit, because this is one of the things that pops up sometimes as, as issues uh, for BIAs is that, you know, in Camlets, we were always just required a notice to reader, which a lot of BIAs do, and that's it's quite sufficient, not a full audit. Because if you've got a BIA that has a small budget, you know, a full audit is very expensive and to have to do that. And it's not, you've got all these other levels of oversight with built into the organization because you have to report to your members at every AGM. So if the members don't support your budget, your BIA is done. So you have that, and then you, your board of directors, of course, is your oversight. So city is a very high level uh, gatekeeper in that process. So yes, you know you, the money comes in through your system and goes out of your system, and, and you're that gatekeeper, and you have to make sure that you know they present their budget and that, that sort of thing, but you know don't get too carried away. 
you know, make sure that they can still function. And partnering is a huge thing. Uh, partnering with your BIA in order to help sustain it, to build relationships and look for those mutually beneficial projects. I mean, to me, it, it just makes sense. Like I've got a couple of pictures here, the, the cigarette butt recycling. I, I say like to say that the city was a butt partner with that project. Um, they were great. Uh, we wanted to do this recycling program and they uh, helped us to purchase the the units and uh, installed them for us. We had a, another group that collects them and then we send the send them in to be recycled. So a really good win-win thing and getting some of the butts off the street. And the planters were another thing. We The city helped us to purchase the planters and it was a B-City project as well because Camelot is a B-City. And you know Home Depot helped us out and the businesses helped to maintain it. So just really good uh, partnering uh, examples. And of course, you can really realize savings as a as a city by um, working with the BIA. So the BIA can often, with a project, do uh, the heavy lifting, as in organizing something. This example here is the tree lights downtown Kamloops. So we wanted tree lights downtown, and the city, of course, was not going to come down there and install a bunch of tree lights for us because it would just cost so much money. But we organized to have the contractor. We decided what kind of lights to use. We ordered the lights. And once we did all, you know, we did all of the hard work, the, the organizing of it, the heavy lifting of it, they were happy to pay for the lights. So it was just a good way of, of getting something done and, and really working together on it. And you can partnering to help serve your community um, because that's what it's all about is really having a, a good building community and, and having a great community. And we did a, a mural project, it's a good example. We got funding from the government. Uh, the building owners had to pay into it. We had lined up artists for it. And you know we got free scaffolding for the wildlife park, that kind of thing. And the city enabled it, but they didn't have to provide any funding for it. So they made sure that, you know, the we helped us through the permit process because we have to have permits in Canada for, for um, murals, which is actually a good idea. Uh, so they enabled it, but they didn't have to put any money into it. So it was great. And it's become a tourist attraction within our community. These are all in the back alleys of our downtown. So it's an alley art gallery. And as uh, Susan mentioned earlier, remember that BIABC is a, a great resource for municipalities and business groups with the, the, the handbook and everything. So there's lots we can help to um, get started. And all the efforts of the BIA and their partners improves public awareness, establishes a positive image for the area, increases customer traffic, and attracts new businesses. So the results are a vibrant community. And that's what we all want, isn't it? This was actually a back alley um, block party that we did. And who would have thought that you could do a party in a back alley and uh, it was awesome and we had tons of people show up this was last summer and we did the, the the mural on the left that sort of is graffiti style that was a temporary mural that we just kind of popped up for the day and then painted over it later but in the background you can see some of them um, some of the other murals that are permanent ones and uh, it was a great uh, great one and these are just a couple of examples of things um, that that smaller BIA can help contribute to economic development. So our state of the downtown report, we gathered together a lot of information that was specific to the downtown and not just Camelot's in general, because if you were looking at trying to attract a business to locate in the downtown, um, they want to know, you know, pedestrian counts and, and what the demographics are and who, you know, who lives there, how much money they make, do they, are they educated, all these kinds of things. And so that, information a lot of it's out there and but it had to be gathered and boiled down to our specific area and that was where some of the information we had to go out and get like the pedestrian counts but other stuff stats canada you know the city had or our ecdev department had so uh, but it, it's a really good economic development tool that our uh, Kamloops uh, ecdev department does use and then the, that's also the a uh, sell sheet there on our city center revitalization tax exemption program. And uh, it's a, a really 
a good program to be able to try and get some uh, development happening in your downtown and it's really starting to see some results now where we've got more residential being built in our downtown which is you need residential in your downtown to be successful So I, I don't know if anybody has any questions at this point or if, Susan, do you want me to just carry on with the, the next section is uh, the stuff for Langley? Um, there was a couple of questions that came up, so we can ask okay. those and then we'll go forward. Um, one question, and so the question is, can a BIA be created in a regional district? I didn't think so, but I thought I'd ask you. In a regional district? Because well, the community it, charter it, language all talks about municipalities. Yeah, so there'd almost have to be, because you have to have a municipal bylaw to make it happen, right? Is Danny yeah. here? <laughs> <laughs> nah, no, he's, he's not. This might be one that we'll have to uh, check with yeah. Danny, and then uh, I'll get back to you. Yeah, uh, that was a little technical for me. Yeah. <laughs> um, is there any reason that a Chamber of Commerce could not be the operating agency of a BIA? Well, I've not seen that happen um, because the a BIA, their mandate is very different from a, a Chamber and just the way that they operate. I mean, a Chamber could help get the BIA up and started, but ideally you would like want to have a separate board of directors and a separate um, nonprofit society for your BIA, but a chamber could certainly be one of the partners to help get it going. Um, so, and this actually, the, the governance question that comes next perhaps helps to touch on why BIA would have its own society. The question was, if an owner is leasing or renting out a space, would the landlord and the business owner get voting rights within the BIA? Well, that is also um, like it, being a member of the BIA is one of the confusing sort of things, because if you're paying the levy, you know, you would be considered to be a member if you're BIA. Um, but what some BIAs do, and that's what we did in Kamloops, is we had another separate voting membership. And so you could, you know, for 20 bucks a year or whatever, you became a voting member whether you were a property owner, you had to be a property owner or a tenant. So you had to you know, be a tenant. So those business tenants are definitely brought into the process because they, they, can be, uh, they can become a member, they can sit on the board because they're actually the ones that end up paying the levy. Let's face it, the property owners, you know, they're gonna push that down to their businesses. So you definitely want those tenants to be um, voting members. So it sounds like that would be a reason why to have a separate nonprofit society for the BIA because uh, mm -hmm. you want to have your own set of bylaws and set out the voting classes of members uh, in the bylaws of the society uh, because you could have a Chamber of Commerce member who's not located within the geographic area that's defined for the BIA. And oh, absolutely. That person to be voting on the expenditure of the funds that are raised from the affected properties. Yeah, that that's exactly. It all comes down to governance, folks. <laughs> it all yeah. comes down to governance. And usually okay. a chamber represents an entire city, yeah. whereas you could have two or three, you know, like in, in Camelot's, we right now currently have two BIAs. We had three at one point. Yeah. And like Pinellas, Pinellas, not a very big town, they actually have three BIAs. Yeah, Pinellas so has three, Campbell River has three, um, Victoria yeah. is, well, the city of Victoria downtown has one. There's lots of different ones in Vancouver. Um, oh, yeah. Some of them yeah. may only be you know, a few blocks long. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what size of community would you believe would be best able to sustain a BIA, taking into consideration the capacity of the community for volunteers? Well, one of the things you have to look at when trying to figure that out is you got to look at the value of your properties. Like if you say, okay, you're down, downtown Merritt, for example, you know, what's the total value of those business properties that are downtown and if you put a, a levy on there of you know 78 cents per thousand of assessed value how much money is that going to raise and you know how much because you can only put you know you don't want to have your levy so high that it's you know people aren't going to want to pay it they're going to really 
revolt against it, um, then how much money does that gather? And can you do anything with that amount of money? So that's kind of what you need to look at is it from that, that financial point of view to say, okay, are we big enough to have a BIA? How many businesses do we have? What's the, um, you know, total value of those properties? How much money could we, you know, reasonably raise? And then what could we do with that money? Could we hire somebody and then still do something? Or once we hired somebody, we wouldn't have any money left to do anything. So it, it's really you got to look at the financial side of it uh, first, even before you sort of look at that volunteer um, availability. Are there some BIAs that don't have paid staff that just run with the board of directors that run the programs? Well, that there may be. I, I'm not aware of any. I know that there are some that have uh, just part-time staff for sure because they're small, but um, it's really difficult to have to really get anything done operating with just a a volunteer board because they have full-time jobs. They have their yeah. businesses. You yes. know, they really don't have, you know, it would just be, you, you do have to have some sort of staff. Yeah. The corner of the desk becomes an awfully large corner of desk. Yes. And the corner of the desk becomes corner. the entire desk. Right. Yes. Yeah. Things fall yeah. off. Okay. So it's not really sustainable. Okay. Thank you. Shall we move on with the okay. other part of the presentation? Yeah, so oh, I'll um, stop my webcam. Here we go. Bye. Okay. <laughs> so, new BIAs uh, have will be responsible for branding their association and informing the membership that they are part of a BIA. So we're different in the sense that our levy comes from the property owners via the municipality. So because there's no direct billing for membership fees, uh, many businesses do not even realize they are part of a BIA. Um, it's important that the scope and responsibility of each BIA is clearly defined as each BIA is different depending on the needs and social dynamics of that community. So simply put, we assist the businesses in our area as to join together to accomplish more than what any one business could accomplish on their own by pooling our resources. So this is true for advertising campaigns, events, promotions, you know, such as Christmas and promoting the business community in general. So we create partnerships in the community with our municipalities, the RCMP and other not-for-profit organizations, such as the Chamber of Commerce, community groups and individual businesses. So this is a good example in um, Langley of the Operation Clean Streets program that they run. And they provide, uh, we provide opportunities for information and ideas exchange as well amongst the businesses through newsletters, meetings, networking opportunities and workshops. Um, we create new and engaging community events and seek sponsorships to help fund them. And that getting additional revenue is a huge piece of what you do as a BIA. Um, in Camelots, we usually ended up doubling our levy by getting sponsorship funds, whether it was cash or in kind. So that sponsorship piece is, is huge to be able to do all of the things you want to do, like uh, these types of events. And we also advocate on the behalf of our members at the municipal level and other levels of government to influence and support policy and bylaw changes. And we work with our uh, municipalities to revitalize and beautify our BIAs and to ensure the business community is informed and has a say in these activities. You always want to have that communication between the municipality and, you know, if they're doing infrastructure, and having that communication between them and the businesses. So the BIA is that um, conduit there. And uh, most importantly, we are the face and the voice that represents our entire BIA. And a little fast fact for you, um, across the province, there are more than 70 established BIAs, which uh, Susan was showing at the beginning, but they represent over 60,000 businesses and 16.5 billion in land value with more than 10 million in combined budgets. And this, these numbers are actually a few years old, but that just gives you an idea of the, um, collectively, we have a very strong voice in our business communities. And so the Langley provides uh, facade improvement grants uh, to their businesses through their Get Fresh program. And quite a few BIs, 
have done the facade improvement grants and it's a really great way to show um, to get immediate change within your within your communities and uh, Langley also ran a recent contest uh, started at langley.com that will provide one new retail business owner over a hundred and thirty thousand dollars in startup assistance huge to get a new business going and this was advertised throughout the province which resulted in dozens of applications and brought tremendous attention to Langley City as a place to open up business so overall you know maybe they're they're giving that 130,000 to one business but what a good business attraction tool because now they've advertised Langley as a good place to do business throughout the province um, and in the in Langley, the DLBA has also worked extensively with Langley City Mayor and Council over the years to ask them to pass bylaws that mitigate the proliferation of some of the following businesses. So pharmacies that dispense methadone, uh, check cashing facilities, pawn shops and thrift stores. Because you really want to have a good business mix within your community and sometimes if you have you know, too many of those types of businesses it really you know, it doesn't attract more of you know, other business, businesses to have a good business mix. <laughs> And the, uh, the BIAs also act as the liaison for any uh, major infrastructure improvements that impact the BIA business. So roadways, underground infrastructure, parkland development, streetscape revite, et cetera. Because we have found that when store owners are upset about business disruption, and you know that happens, um, it works much better if they have an informed and involved person on the other end of the concerns. And also that, you know, they've maybe gotten that information before they start ripping the street up, not when they start ripping the street up. So it's really important that we work with the city in, in advance of these things. And uh, Langley City actually invests over $500,000 a year in beautification and revite of their downtown core, like hanging baskets, banners, street furniture, event support, et cetera. So which when you add that to the DLBA, 430,000 a year budget, really allows for continuous forward momentum from a um, uh, development perspective. So again, pooling money and, and getting more bang for your buck. And uh, Langley City and the DLBA have an outstanding relationship where both parties respect the work that the other does. They partner in numerous economic development opportunities while not stepping on each other's toes. Always good not to step on your mayor's toes. As a result, despite the city's small size, they rival larger communities where sometimes BIA funding is allocated to what would normally be municipally funded items. So it's one of the things you always have to be cautious of as a new BIA is that you're not getting things downloaded onto you from your municipality. I mean, it, it, it's it's tempting to do that as a municipality, but you know you, you've got to make sure that the money is the BIA money is really used uh, in the right way. So renewal. <clears throat> now we've created a BIA and five years later we have to renew it. So uh, because a typical renewal period is every five years. Some will go seven or eight or some 10. Somebody did 20, but it was amazing. I don't know how they did that. With how, how can you budget 20 years out? But anyway, um, but the process of renewal should start at least eight months before the renewal is required because there's a lot of groundwork you have to do. And there's approximately a two month timeline required for renewal, uh, the actual bylaw part of it, which, uh, you know, your first, second and third reading of the new BIA bylaw, which is prepared by the municipality. And this is the time for the BIA to ask for any increase in their levy or expanding their area or extending the renewal period, et cetera. And then the petition against the bylaw, so the first reverse petition is mailed out to the affected property owners and they have 30 days to respond. So then if you know the reverse petition fails, which means success, um, the bylaw then goes to council for the fourth and final reading. And I'm sure you understand, but I'll just uh, reiterate how a reverse petition works. And first of all, it's the reverse petitions are designed for the BIA to succeed, which is good. So for a reverse to be successful and for a BIA to be discontinued, a total of 51% of the property owners and 51% of the total commercial value of the properties in the BIA boundary uh, must vote against the renewal. So it's not just, you know, you can have a couple of big guys that have, you know, big value properties getting rid of it. You have to have 
at least you know 51% by number and by value. So it's a good um, a good way that they do that. Um, some of the usual requirements for Marion Council that they want to know for going into renewal is a report outlining the successes of the BIA since the last renewal, which also highlights any new concepts and projects for the future, uh, sort of a plan going forward. And that's always a good thing to include with the letter, the, the reverse petition that the city sends out. And some cities allow that and some don't, but I think they all should allow to have something like that sent out with their letter so that all the property owners get that information, the successes in the future. And then this, the city, of course, would want the budget projection for the next five years of the renewal, if that's the term. And uh, particularly if an increase in the levy has been requested because you want to say, you know, why you're increasing the levy? What are you going to do with that money? Where is it going? And then the BIA would come to council and do a presentation at a council meeting just prior to that first, second, and third reading of, of the bylaw. And um, so each municipality, as Susan said, has is different uh, about when it comes to what they require from the BIA as backup material uh, for the request for the renewal. But some of them are things like testimonials from business owners and property owners. I mean, that's a nice thing to have. I don't think it should be a requirement, but it's it's always good to add in as a BIA to add in anything that you can to show that there's value there. So I've often done that is gotten testimonials from owners and having that, you know, success report. Uh, so this is what we've done up until now. And, and this is the plan going forward. So that's um, a very important piece. Oh yes. So this is just gives you a little short cap of some of that. Um, requirements there or the renewal process and uh, that's it for me okay thank you Gabe so this was uh, content that uh, Terry James contributed uh, for the webinar from the uh, Township of Langley so we just have one question around this uh, around the renewal process well I'll put my webinar my webcam back on so you can see me Hi. Um, so the reverse petition is created. Does it kind of trick businesses into agreeing? Is there a little ethical question there? <laughs> is, is the reverse petition method, is that designed to sort of trick businesses into uh, agreeing to go forward with it? Well, I wouldn't look at it as tricking them. It, what it is is that, you know, Usually it's always those negative people that are going to come out and vote anyway. So you give those, the, the people that are going to be negative about it, they're going to come out and they're going to say yes and they're going to vote against it. But the people that are in favor of it don't have to do anything as far as voting. So it's just, I, I don't know, I think it's a good, um, a good process to go, a, a good process for renewal myself. Yeah, in, in general, if you're happy with the status quo, you may not actually be paying attention to civic processes. And if it was right. a, a, a positive petition, you may miss the opportunity to say, I like this, keep going. It's usually those who are unhappy who are watching for the opportunity to stop something. Um, yeah. yeah, so it's... Yeah, so they have that opportunity if, yeah. if there and is... Emailed, yeah, it's, it's sent out to every person who has the right to vote. Uh, so all of those partial, all those business owners who are affected by the levy. Um, so if they want to come forward and, and speak against it, they have that opportunity. It's fair. Well, it, it actually goes the property owners. It doesn't yes. necessarily go to the tenants, which is kind right. of a little unfortunate in a way, because the tenants are often the ones that see the benefits of the BIA because they're the ones with the business on the street. So it's always as a BIA, it's a good approach to go to your businesses and give them all the information and say, talk to your landlord and tell them that, yes, this is good. I'm willing to have, because you're paying it, he's not going to pay it and not send it down to you. Yeah. So, you know, you, you go to your landlord and say, hey, I'm happy to pay the BIA levy because actually when you look at how much an individual business pays, it really doesn't amount often, it doesn't amount to a whole bunch in a year. Like it might only be a couple hundred dollars or, uh, you know, I have anywhere from, you know, a hundred bucks up to, you know, several thousand. So 
you know, to ha have those those tenants talk to the property owners because it is the property owners that, you know, have the vote because they're the ones that get the letter from the city. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, we have time for some more questions and we have one more poll, one more pop quiz to run based on Gay's presentation. Here's your opportunity. What are the roles of a municipality in working with a BIA? There's multiple correct questions, and on this, you're actually allowed to choose more than one option. So some of these, however, are not correct. I believe you can take your vote off of the ones that you think are incorrect. So I, I know that some people have left us, they've, they've gone back, to, their lunch break is over, so we'll just leave this open. We've got 63% voter turnout, which is still pretty good in British Columbia. That's excellent. We're up to 70% now, so a couple more seconds here as more votes come in, and uh, there are more than one correct answer, and you can choose more than one option on this quiz. So. All right, we've got 94% submission here. That's fabulous. So let's share the results back. The roles of a municipality in working with the BIA. So uh, absolutely yes, encouraging the formation of BIA, supporting the organization. The municipality, if I'm right, Gate, does not actually define what the business promotion scheme will be. Is that right? Oh, you might be muted again. Okay. Well, oh, no. Yes, they, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> I thought I turned the camera off in here. <laughs> I can't tell. Um, yeah. No. The the business the city does not determine that. Right. Um, but the municipality does partner with the business community, but they don't do the audit of the financial statements. So that's up to the society. That the that would never be a requirement. <laughs> yeah, that would be. Uh, Knowing some uh, directors of finance, uh, I can tell you that they're not looking for extra work. So yeah. no, they, they want to see the financial statements in some cases, but actually doing an audit, nope. All right, that is all we have for our polls today. I'm just gonna check to see if we have any more questions right now. And I'll take the presenter back. We have some discussion time. There we go. Oh, well, I'll just check for questions. Oh, there was one more question. I'm just going to pop this out here so I can take a look at it. Uh, are there any restrictions on uh, a BIA's board of director membership? So you, uh, maybe you can't be an elected member in your municipality or you can't be a government employee. Are there any restrictions for a BIA? Well, generally, it, that's in the, the bylaws of the BIA. And generally, you want to them they're usually either a property owner or a business owner um, there's often there will be a city council liaison a non-voting liaison on the board but not as a board member because okay. that is considered a conflict of interest okay what if there's a city council member who's a business owner well, that has, uh, I actually have had business owners that ran for council that were on my board at the time, and they stepped off the board. And that is something that is written into some bylaws. Uh, not, I don't think it is in the standard bylaws, but it is uh, often written into bylaws that if you do, you know, run for elected office that you have to step off the board. Great. But they did it voluntarily because mm -hmm. they saw it as a conflict of interest. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. But technically, you know, it depends on the bylaws of the BIA. <laughs> whether they, if they don't it's governance. It, it, they could. Yeah. It's they governance. Could. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. All right. Like, Thank you very much. Board. Yeah. So we have no more questions coming up. I just want to run through some final slides about what's coming up in our uh, webinar series. So we've got um, economic reconciliation is our topic for next Thursday. Uh, this is with Paul Assert, and he'll be talking about what economic reconciliation looks like and how do we engage in economic activities uh, without sort of recreating some of the traditional uh, control and manipulation 
that has happened in our economic system. Uh, and so there's a link for that. It's a pretty easy one, bit.ly slash June 7th dash three. Uh, the dash three helps me keep track of why, where people found out about my webinars. So I'm looking at my marketing tools. Uh, June 19th, uh, from 10 until 11 a.m., we'll be doing a uh, workshop on a part of our Tech Dev 101 workshop series, actually. Uh, we're looking at the innovation ecosystem model. Unfortunately, I forgot to put the link in my PowerPoint presentation, but uh, if you give me a, a, a little bit of time after this, you'll be able to use bit.ly slash June 19th dash three. Uh, so using this, the same mechanism, that's my code for links I post on my webinars. Uh, if you have not been getting our webinar invitations, if you found out about this webinar from somewhere else and you want to get our webinars, you go to this link, uh, cm.pn slash, you're going to have to write this down, slash 3inj. Unfortunately, GoToWebinar doesn't let you just click on my links. So you just have to write that one down. Uh, when you're signing up, title is your job title and company name is your organization. And that just helps me see what kind of roles we have on our distribution list and where you're from. Uh, once again, I mentioned we're having the Tech Dev 101 webinar on the 19th. You can also request the full day workshop to come to your community. Uh, we're doing these throughout the year and throughout the province. Uh, the workshop uh, talks about tech and innovation basics, and it actually takes a really customized focus look at your community with up to 30 uh, community leaders, and, um, tech entrepreneurs, chamber of commerce people, municipal people, and just really talks about what the tech and innovation ecosystem is like in your community and how to build on your strengths as a community using tech and innovation as an economic development driver. It is not all about how to get gaming companies to move to your town, uh, although that's a good thing. It is really about what's happening here and how do we make sure that we're getting the benefits of tech and innovation. So email us if you'd like to request one of those workshops. We are starting to fill up, so get your email request in soon. Uh, we have a certain budget, of course, but um, this has been a really popular one. Um, so we're really excited. It happened in Penticton just uh, this week, in fact. So after this webinar, you will uh, have a pop-up link to complete the feedback survey, and I'll be posting the recording of this in about a week. And don't forget to register for our next webinar. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Thank you, Gay, for participating, and also thank you to Terry James from uh, the Langley BIA and to Lori Baxter from the Business Improvement Associations of BC to uh, get us connected and make this happen. So I will be Thanks shutting off the webinar. Thanks for having me. Thanks, Gay. You're, you're welcome. All right. Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to end it all. Goodbye, everybody.